welcome to Web3 and Whiskey, a podcast about how the decentralized internet will change our lives. In each episode, we react to a future when users and communities have all of the power and when our digital lives could be as vibrant as our real life. And we drink whiskey while doing it. I'm your host, Gary Liu. And as always, I'm joined by Suresh Balaji, founder of the Web3 Marketing Association, and Malcolm Ong, a product leader and serial entrepreneur. And we also have our producer, Disco Wolf, with us. We call him D-Dubs. He is here to fact check and judge our opinions. If D-Dubs likes what we say, you're going to hear. If he dislikes our opinion, you will hear. Now, historically, D-Dubs has been very, very nice to us. Uh, He has warned us this week that he has come out of hibernation uh, and he is ready to judge. So uh, let's see, Suresh and Malcolm, how we do with with, with D-Dubs this week. Quick disclaimer, we don't show projects on this podcast. So consider any of the excitement you hear from us to be personal opinion. And our personal opinions should never be taken as investment advice of any kind. We've actually been off for the last couple of weeks because there have been people traveling. And it's actually been a really busy week, uh, a couple of weeks for Web3 in Asia specifically. So uh, Malcolm and Suresh, what have you guys been up to since we last recorded? Not much on my end. I mean, I've been here in Hong Kong, just heads down, focus on working. So a little bit boring, I suppose. But, <laughs> yeah. What about you, Suresh? I know you've been on the road. Wow, I've been on the road. And um, yeah, I went to Dubai for a week. It was the week of Jitex in Dubai. Uh, though I didn't go to Jitex, Jitex has turned into this. It used to be this hardware show uh, when I lived in Dubai. And now it's turned into this massive technology fest huge and uh it's, it's yeah and uh, it's all become web3 now so all, all the blockchain firms are there all the nft firms are there uh all the regulators were i mean at least some of the regulators were there and i landed up going for my first perhaps the first ever uh, blockchain party so or whatever that means but it was an irl party but it was a blockchain party for the, for the sort of opening of the future blockchain summit and uh, and guess what? I I bumped into Gary, not at the party, but in Dubai. And um, we didn't share whiskey, but we did share a shisha, which was great. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, you got to do Dubai. when you're in Dubai, right? Exactly. Uh, so it was it was a Web three filled week for me there. And uh, now I'm in London on holiday, and uh, there's so much going on. I, uh, you know, a few days ago, I just recorded a podcast for performance marketing world around the metaverse. Uh, and there's never a day when we're not having a Web3 conversation, I see, yeah. even though I'm on holiday. Hey, busy couple of weeks. Uh, as Suresh said, I was also traveling. I also went to London and Dubai and Singapore just to spend time with Web3 people, talk to investors, talk to entrepreneurs, talk to regulators, learn more about the space. There is so much happening around the world, and it's so incredibly exciting. Not all of it is real. Uh, but it's all have uh, generally has good intent behind it, especially now. That, that is true. The people who are still building in that it is, uh, they have good intent, I think. Yeah. That, that is true, Gary. I mean, here is a question for you, right? As you travel around, how much of Web3 is still in the hype zone and how much is reality? I, I think a lot of the hype has just, it's, it's, it's faded away, right? It's burned off into the ether uh, because of the, of the crypto crash. Um, a lot of the f- opportunists, people who are there, Frankly, some of them are very scammy, but some of them just taking advantage of the hype. They've left to do other things because there's really no easy money anymore. Um, And the people who are left have a very real intent to build a new infrastructure, to build a new decentralized world that ostensibly should be better for all of us. So uh, the folks that I'm meeting are, I mean, they're, they're, they all, they, they all have like, you know, big, ideas uh and it's been it's been awesome having these conversations you learn so much just from a single dinner when you're on one of these trips all right uh well malcolm i think you gotta hit the road again soon so hopefully uh, you'll be (laughs) recording one of these podcasts um remotely with us at some point i mean remotely as in not in hong kong at some point uh before we get to the main discussion which for today is wtf is the metaverse okay this is a big one so before we ask the question, WTF is the metaverse, let's talk about our whiskeys. So, Suresh, you're back in London, so it's like 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you're not drinking, especially because you're on a family vacation. But I have to assume, since you're in the UK, you've had one or two good whiskeys in the last couple of days. I, I have had whiskeys, but I wouldn't say anything to write home about. But I must admit, uh, though this is a whiskey-themed uh, podcast, 
I did try a rum called Kraken. I don't know if you have. Of so, course. Yeah. Oh my word! And they have they have a roast coffee flavor. Oh, that um, I have not seen. So it has been it has been brilliant. I think I must have polished half a bottle off one of those nights because it was just really just tasty. straight. <laughs> straight, just straight. You, you can. It's funny. I mean, I I never thought I could do rum straight, but rum straight. I mean, on on the rocks, it's really it's really delicious. Well, now you're looking like Steve Jobs, so obviously that's a good drink. <laughs> Roasted coffee kraken turns you into Steve Jobs. Uh, what about you, Malcolm? What have you been drinking? Uh, today I just got a standard Chivas Regal yeah. blended. Just whatever Good I order. had in the, the, the <laughs> cupboard today. Yeah. Trusty. Chivas, I'm telling you, man. Chivas, especially the aged Chivas, are very, very interesting. I think I may have told the story before, but I've been to uh, uh, one of the key Chivas distilleries and where they blend Chivas Regal. And um, they actually have a phenomenal 25-year-old blend. Um, but the thing is they bottle it at 42%, but out of cast is 57% cast strength. And it tastes a complete different whiskey. And I honestly think that what that ship is 25 directly out of cask. It's one of the best whiskeys I've ever had in my life. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter how much money you want to pay for it. You can't buy it. Um, what I have to hear today is a Dali win. I think a couple of uh, episodes ago, um, I brought another one of these, what they call flora and fauna labels from Diageo. So this sort of collection of, of a single malt whiskeys that usually are not bottled as single malts because they're primarily used in Diageo mm -hmm. blends. And, and this one specifically um, is, is one of the main fillers of Johnny Walker blends. So very hard to find as an independent or individual bottling, a single bottling. And this one is their, um, their 16 year old. It's a very, very old distillery built in the mid 19th century, has a lot of history. At one point was delivering huge amounts through the very, very famous Straths Bay Railway uh, to whiskey lovers all over the United Kingdom and all over the world. Um, now, I, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly for um, Johnny Walker. It's uh, the filler for Johnny Walker. But look at this. I, I, my camera's not great, but it honestly has one of the most beautiful colors that I've seen in a single mall. It's just like, it's almost like the rose gold that Mr. Steve Jobs over here has been trying to, <laughs> you know, has always wanted in his computer and his hardware products. But it's just an absolutely beautiful space site. It smells peated. It's not. And uh, I mean, it just has an incredible amount of moss and barley. It, it really just tastes like a farm, which I guess makes sense because the distillery founder for Dali Wynn was originally just a farmer. So... Thanks for sharing the whiskeys, Malcolm. Cheers, Suresh. Hope that cheers. you feel okay after that half bottle of Kraken. Cheers, gents. <laughs> That's right. Cheers. Oh, that is so good. I don't know why they don't bottle this more often as, as, in, as a single bottling. I, I need to bring this next time we see each other in person to share. It's so good. Uh, by the way, D-Dubs, at some point, we probably need to collate all of the whiskeys we've talked about on this podcast. Because I, I don't remember what I've sipped and talked about. Uh, and eventually I'm going to start doubling up and it's going to be, it's going to really hurt my, you know, whiskey connoisseur reputation. So help me out here. Let's, let's get a list together. Well, I like the way you say collate. It's not, is it not collate? What, what is it? What's collate? <laughs> what, what, what am I doing? Am I saying, am I breaking it down to two distinct yeah. collate? He's, he's, yeah. He's correcting your English. Oh my goodness. From so London. He's, in England, you he's see. in London, so he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> Collate. <laughs> collate. 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 Oh, now I'm going to be so conscious of... <sighs> Suresh, thank you. Um, all right. We want to get to our main discussion, but before that, as always, we're going to get some reactions to the news. D-Dubs, what do you have for us this week? Number one, Formula One files eight trademarks for crypto and NFTs. Suresh, what do you think? The most important thing, as we've always spoken about, is Web3 as a cultural movement. And at the heart of this cultural moment is the community angle. Um, Web3 projects thrive where there are communities. That's, that's the sort of catalyst for anything. And F1 fans are and have been ardent, insane, passionate community members. So um, I think it's fertile ground. Yeah, I would agree here. I don't personally follow F1, but you know, just like any sport that has an amazing fan base, 
Um, I think it just makes sense. NFTs creates that uh, environment for these types of communities. Um, and I think F1 in particular, right, is a uh, specific type of segment of users that I think would just eat up NFTs and cryptos in general. So, uh, and certainly as a sport, it's quite expensive for these teams. So perhaps also a way for them to raise money here. How do you not follow F1, Malcolm? I was about to say. Yeah, I, I'm into cars. I'm into racing. Then how do you uh, I not follow really F1? I just never really got into F1. Oh. It's like the same. I don't, I don't know. And you, you have I, never I like watched Drive types. to Survive? You've never watched a Netflix documentary? I, I've watched. I mean, I've been at an F1 race before. Um, I've started watching the Netflix documentary. Never really hooked on. Wow. I, I think I, I got I to gotta spend more time with it. No, I was saying uh, secretly, Malcolm um, is is undercover for Extinction Rebellion. He's all about, <laughs> or, or you know, and he is trying to sort of, you know, all the stop oil protests and yeah, fighting stop for oil. sustainability. And uh, he, he hugs trees. He does lots of those stuff. So it, it hurts. Yeah, that's his funny because sustainability cause sentimentalities. The only quote unquote F one race I've been to is an E F one electric F one race. Yeah. Just look at Malcolm's hair. There's a lot of oil derivative products in that hair. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't have that height. Uh, listen, I'm I'm actually quite surprised that it took F1 this long to file trademarks for crypto and NFTs. Because F1 has been represented in the Web3 world for many years. For several years, um, they were the lead brand or IP in Animoca's car racing game. Um, and, uh, and they've also had NFT crypto sponsors for the last couple of years galore, putting a lot of money into sponsorship on their cars, on their drivers, um, just even in the, in the barriers around the racetracks. Um, and the brand of the assets really, as, as Malcolm put it, really makes sense for GameFi. But it's not so much just the people who follow F1 and how committed they are to F1 and their drivers and the teams. There's the fact that we're talking about cars, right? The entire idea of F1 is that you can construct right you can build a car that goes faster than somebody else's by changing tiny little components and that's freaking perfect for nft uh, gaming right so i'm actually really surprised that it took them this long to file um any trademarks again we've said this in the last few episodes we're going to see a huge ip and registration land grab in web3 as more and more people realize oh we're going to exist in this world eventually anyway we don't know how the laws are going to work so we might as well get our trademarks uh, just in case so uh, this makes sense to me. All right. Number two item. Board Ape creator Yuga Labs faces SEC Pro over the unregistered offerings. Welcome. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the SEC has been hunting for scapegoats in the crypto realm, right? And now, of course, they're taking aim at one of the most iconic NFT project teams. Um, I don't think and, I, and I, I certainly hope that they don't actually sue Yuga Labs here. Um, perhaps this is just uh, a way for them to target them for publicity purposes, right? I think they've been trying to figure out regulation here, and it makes sense that um, Board Ape um, should be on that list to at least be um, considered to sort of look at. Now, I do find it interesting, though, beyond the NFT project itself, how will ApeCoin specifically out of Yuga Labs be interpreted? Um, that might be an interesting aspect to this. Of course, the head of the SEC at present has to be named Gary. That makes me even the more sadder. To Malcolm's point, this is a probe. It's discovery. It's not necessarily a lawsuit. And I really do hope that it doesn't turn into a lawsuit because if the SEC tries to sue Yuga Labs, um, the ripple effects of this is going to be far, 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 far more impactful than anything else the SEC has done and said over the course of the last several years. Because Board Apes is the best example we have on what the e NFT ecosystem can eventually become, right? Its value is from not only its scarcity, but really the access that it grants. This is a membership model. This is the promise of, in many ways, the promise of Web3, uh, the quote-unquote democratization of assets and uh, commercial rights and all of these things. And by no means is Board Apes perfect. By no means is Yuga Labs without controversy. But if they go after Board Apes, then they go after everything, right? Or almost everything that has already been innovated in this space. And I think that that would, uh, that, that we have to say goodbye to innovation for quite some time until we know exactly what is allowed and not allowed. So I sure as heck hope that Board Apes or Mutant Apes or even ApeCoin are not regulated 
as securities, because I think we'd be in a little bit of trouble if that were the case. Uh, this also means that the tabling of the Loomis Gillibrand bill that we've talked about before, this bill that two U.S. senators from either from from uh, from each from a, a different party um, have tabled, um, it's supposed to it's supposed to uh, you know become law within the next six months, or at the very least, be debated for law in the next six months. That cannot come soon enough because when that if that does become law. What happens is that these kinds of assets very specifically get set aside uh, to be removed from SEC governance um, and 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 and, uh, and regulation, and I think that that is uh, the, the the right move for the United States and probably for the world. I look at it from a brand owner's perspective or a brand manager's perspective. BAYC's advent as a Web three first brand has been fascinating. But there's been lots of allegations about racism initially, and then the subtle hints of Nazism, um, all of that. And it, this shouldn't be good for their brand, would it, in some ways? But on the other side, I feel, you know, but like all things Web3, things are really counterintuitive. Uh, any PR becomes good PR, and suddenly BAYC becomes a stronger brand because somebody's actually looking at it. I, I don't know what happened to ape prices and floor prices after the probe started, but I would imagine that the community is so strong and the followership is, followership is so strong that it's highly likely that this will push uh, prices up because it's giving it even more reach. Okay, you want some PR? I have some good PR for you. Portugal proposes a 28% tax on annual crypto trading profits next year. The tax will apply to capital gains from crypto held for less than a year. Derek? Well, crypto taxes are inevitable, right? They're, they're going to come. Uh, the, the bigger question is how do you track and enforce it when crypto wallets are anonymous? We've talked about this in the past. Uh, it's about DIDs, ways to authenticate crypto assets and wallets without giving up on privacy. That's not a solution that exists today. And somebody out there is going to have to build that DID solution. Um, so we should not be surprised that jurisdictions where there's a lot of crypto trading and Portugal has been one of them where a lot of people literally have gone and moved to Portugal because it's a very welcoming tax regime for for crypto traders. Um, so it, it shouldn't be a surprise that people are starting to think about taxes. Uh, governments are missing out on a lot of tax dollars. Uh, you know, e even right now with the, with the markets way down, they're still missing out. Now, for Portugal specifically, this might in fact dampen some of the interest that the country has gained with their golden visas and golden passports. Uh, folks that I think all of us know, um, friends in our communities, have been investing in Portugal, yeah, putting quite a bit of money into real estate in Portugal, into building businesses in Portugal, with the hope of getting that passport, but also because uh, both the regulatory and the tax regime is quite uh, inviting. And that this changes the calculus. So I, I do wonder if some of our friends are going to just stop the process, stop the investment, and what that could mean to Portugal long term. I think there's a broader thing at play here. Clearly, the world is going into some sort of a weird recession mode, high inflation. Governments are thinking of new revenue streams, new income streams. And, uh, and then Portugal sees all these crypto bros walking around buying cars, buying mansions, buying all sorts of stuff, even though... Maybe maybe they, they they wanted to react to it when crypto was at an all time high, but by the time they got to creating this sort of tax rule, uh, crypto crypto has sort of crashed. But uh, but I think this is just you know any government seeing all these people landing up and uh, buying up property, creating creating sort of um, you know I'm sure local populations are not happy about all of these folks coming up and snagging um, uh, and snatching up all these all these big mansions. So they're going after them. Unfortunately, many of these people don't, uh, who used to have flashy cars probably sold their cars now, right? And their watches and their jewelry. There are not many people around right now who can, uh, who can afford the tax, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I think this one's a little bit disappointing to hear, right? Because as Gary mentioned, Portugal is supposed to be one of the crypto-friendly countries uh, for the wider crypto community um, and, and seen as an, you know, quote unquote, ally. Um, I, I certainly don't have any issues with taxes in general, right? And that's, uh, like Gary said, it's inevitable, but it's just that they initially marketed, you know, itself as a tax haven and then just seemed to completely do a 180 here. And it's effectively rugging everyone who's already started to set up shop. So I think that's the, the disappointing part here. I, I do want to clarify that I have no problem with there being a crypto tax. I think it's, it's inevitable because government should be allowed to, I mean, it's income. 
right? And even at 28%, I mean, frankly speaking, this is effectively short-term capital gains, right? Uh, it's still cheaper than 37.5% in the United States for short-term capital gains. It's still cheaper than the United Kingdom. Uh, so it, it, it might still end up, just because it's the first is probably why it feels like, ugh. But um, at the end of the day, it might still be a relatively friendly tax regime for, for crypto. So we'll see. Okay, number four. Former Google Ads boss launches a Web3 search startup with backing from Coinbase and other top VCs. His company called NXYZ trolls blockchains and their applications for data on things like NFTs and crypto wallets, and then streams it to developers in real time. Suresh. I haven't seen their white paper. I would, I would love to, um, but I just read news articles about them, right? I mean, literally everyone's piling into them, into that space. Uh, to try and invest in them, Coinbase and Sequoia, Greylock, Balaji Shinivas, and the list is just so long. Uh, the number of people who have who want to invest in NXYZ, so they must be they must be doing something right with their white paper or their pitch deck. Uh, initially, when I saw the headline, uh, I thought they were building a Brave competitor of some sorts. I mean, Brave went from being uh, a browser to a search engine to a wallet. Um, and uh, they even, I think Brave even did a um, DX. Uh, I thought, wow, that's that's fascinating because you know, Brave probably needs competition. Then I figured out, well, they're actually indexing blockchain data. Uh, I don't know what that looks like technically. I'm probably on thin ground here, and I would love to hear Malcolm's views. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. So, so this former Google Ads boss, he started a, a search engine company called Neva, and Neva is very similar to Brave Ethos, privacy first. You know, which means no ads, no trackers. Um, now, interestingly and ironically, this ex this is exactly the opposite of Google's business model, right? Google makes billions of dollars of revenues through through ads because of search. Um, but this new project and XYZ is actually a way to figure out how to monetize that search engine. I think because if they can't make money from consumers, then how else can they use this tech to effectively monetize? And so they've created this thing to do exactly what you said, Suresh, is indexing the blockchain data and then targeted this towards developers and enterprises rather than consumers. So I think, okay, that's smart. And in fact, yes, we absolutely need a solution to index blockchain data um, in a more developer -friendly, friendlier way. So, you know, more power to them. There's lots, there's a lot of startups that are trying to do this, but, um, you know, it's a problem that has not yet been solved. So more power to them. I think the headline, or for most people who read the headline, they'll probably focus on Google as opposed to Google ads. Right? So this is a Google ads boss. He knows exactly what uh, search ads mean to the internet. And I think that this is a play to replace search, to replace search ads, not necessarily search. Um, you don't need tracking. You can be privacy first and still deliver incredible search ads. Because search is intent-based. So if you type into a search box something, I don't need to have tracked you on cookies. I mean, I can improve the search results if I do know a lot about you using trackers. But I don't need to know all that other stuff about you. Just based on your intent, I can find you what you need. And in Web3, I can then serve ads against that. So I, I think that right now he's saying no ads, no trackers. I, I, uh, let's see how long that lasts. Uh, now, if we're going to talk about fan employees, um, Launching blockchain tech, I think that the launch of Aptos and Minston Labs is more interesting. These are two layer one protocols that have just been launched by ex-Facebook Meta employees. Uh, both teams used to work on DM, which was the Facebook uh, blockchain protocol play. Uh, and they, they, they all left when, when, when DM got shuttered. Uh, and both of these teams are building layer one protocols to onboard the next billion blockchain users. And... Although we never got to see DM in the light, uh, my understanding from talking to industry insiders is that the DM technology was really freaking solid, right? I had to scale at Facebook scale, but with blockchain. Um, and we haven't seen that yet, right? There is still a layer one war and battle going on because no one can really figure out that scale. And so I think that it's worthwhile to watch Aptos and Miston Labs very closely. They all have the same people who back them so effectively, these people with money is just throwing money at all of the different potential solutions. Doesn't matter that they're direct competitors to see what shakes out because we don't know how many more layer one protocols we need or how many layer one protocols we can handle before we have the big three or four that will become the uh, the you know the, the base infrastructure for Web three. So 
that I think is more interesting than um, than this Google Ads boss story. Hmm. Okay, final news item of the week. Azuki introduces the physical backed token PBT. Malcolm? Yeah, I think first of all, kudos to the team. Uh, I think they uh, constantly show themselves innovating in this space and creating something new. So, you know, kudos to them for pushing the envelope and, and doing things new. But I think when I first looked at this, I thought it was kind of a little bit gimmicky and mostly because it's effectively going backwards the other direction, right? Going from NFT and digital, um, connecting it to the physical world. Um, not to say that that's not needed, that doesn't happen, but I just felt like it was a, a more of a publicity stunt, if anything. Um, but the two things that they're trying to address is, you know, number one is that NFTs don't yet proxy to a physical item. Uh, and then the number two is that the physical item, um, you know, itself requires verification. Um, and so for the first part, you know, again, um, I, I take the stance of like NFTs trying to push um, everyone towards digital. So things are only digital in the future. Um, but certainly in the second piece, right? Yes, if you're looking to tokenize everything in the real world, if you're looking to buy and sell sneakers and you need to basically somehow tie that to a physical object, then fine. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I just was less excited about this when I read more about it. So at first glance, I agree with Malcolm that I thought it was a gimmick, but then I really thought about it. And I actually now think that it is really interesting. Um, for a couple of reasons. The first is it will help to onboard a lot of traditional brands, especially luxury brands, into Web3. And that has to be good for the ecosystem, right? You finally are going to have these traditional brands who sell very, very expensive physical products uh, move into Web3 not as a gimmick, not like selling an accompanying NFT or just some badges, but actually using NFTs for what they're, they're, they were designed for, their authentication certificates of some kind, having a digital asset that has the worth of a potential physical asset and tying those things together. I actually think that having a, um, a blockchain-based sort of authentication chip embedded in the physical product, which is what the Azuki, uh, the Azuki protocol requires, is really, really interesting because now, besides luxury brands, the second thing that makes it interesting is now it's going to start impacting the global trade of physical art and artifacts. And that's the world I live in. I mean, I'm even wearing the Artifact Labs uh, shirt today, right? But we are trying to create digital facsimiles of really, really important historical assets that need to be preserved and that actually should be decentrally owned by people around the world. And, uh, and our metadata standard is trying to connect the physical and the digital, but without the necessarily the verification in between. And if this chip allows for that, I could see this be a standard that, that our project decides to look at and potentially adopt and become a partner to. Uh, because that online, offline connection, we can say that it's not important right now, but at the end of the day, it still needs to be. We still exist in a physical world, but part of our identity and part of our assets gonna live in a digital world. Not having that connection may actually limit the growth and scale of Web3 in the future. And also last thing I'll say, this makes sense considering that the big name that just bought into Azuki is Adrian Chen, the, uh, the, the property magnet um, from Hong Kong, who is very much into the luxury world, who has spent a lot of time with the LVMH heirs, right? There's a lot of pictures of them together. Um, and so uh, I, I, I can absolutely imagine that Adrian was the one that, well, uh, you know, played a part in pushing for this physical to digital connection, this digital, which this word I hate, but whatever, this digital connection, because um, I think it benefits his business, it benefits his luxury malls around the world, benefits his relations, and it really is, um, you know, this is this is a huge part of his personal identity and interest. I, I loved the launch video of this, right? I don't know if you've seen the launch of the blue chip, as they call it. I mean, this is really well done uh, video. You got if you haven't, you should look it up. I mean, as a brand, Azuki has its cult following, and then they create a product now, which will, of course, the community will immediately latch onto and buy into, and they are going to try and use it wherever possible. I don't know what price points. I don't know how that's going to be. Uh, but uh, that that bean chip thing sounds really cool. Uh, it looks like it looks like a bean, uh, and it's sort of you know, and and they've created this entire philosophy called scan to own. Um, so they're also trying to create new vernacular around the space. Um, you know, we we heard of play to earn and you know read to earn and something else, and now finally scan to own. So you they're trying to make the whole journey easy uh, by saying, hey, you you know, put this bean chip on a product. And then you scan it, and then that that turns into an NFT of some sorts. 
but I still can't figure out. I'm I'm with Malcolm here. How does this turn from gimmick to reality? I mean, you could stick it on anything and call it anything. Who verifies the origination of the first scan? Um, I could I could stick it on my Shure MV5 mic and and say it's an MV7. But who 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 verifies it? Right. So that's uh, that's where it is. I think there is no third party verification process available. You could you could rip the chip off and put it on something else. Um, suddenly we are getting into the zone of. I, I agree with you, Gary. We, we've got to be able to, you know, permeate both worlds in some way and create the bridge and the connection. But this is very different from uh, Artifact Labs creating NFTs of, um, you know, front pages because it's done by Artifact Labs and we trust Artifact Labs and it's it's a it's a it's a source that you know it, it's real. But here, everybody turns into a person or or an organization that can create a physical backed token. Uh, but how do I trust those people? I don't know. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, the fact that the standard is open source and there is no governance around it at this point. So very valid. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your reactions to the news. That was uh, that was an informative and important segment, especially because we've been off for a couple of weeks. All right. Speaking of connections between worlds, our main topic today is WTF is the metaverse. So seriously, what is the metaverse? Everyone has heard the term now. But if I ask five people, I'm going to get six different answers on what the metaverse actually is. Webster's English Language Dictionary. No, I'm kidding. Um, colloquially, the metaverse is a 3D virtual world. Colloquially. Popularized through years of science fiction, including Ready Player One, which is a, you know, it is a book and now a movie that people often refer to in this day and age when talking about the metaverse uh, for both this dystopian, you know, picture of the future that the book really painted and also the possibilities that it suggested. So that's colloquially what the metaverse is. But in application, the metaverse is definitely digital, but not always 3D. It might be an open environment where you can do whatever you want, or it could be very limited and on rails. It might be private, or it can be extremely public. It might require real identities or be completely synonymous. And it might be built on blockchain or completely centralized on the servers of a big corporation. So frankly, at this point, it's quite hard to say where the boundaries are at. The term has also become synonymous along with crypto, blockchain, NFTs, and Web3. Like it's all of these terms are interchangeable now, which is not like it's not correct. They're not supposed to be interchangeable. And then ambiguity is a big part of the problem of not really knowing what the metaverse is. Everyone uses this term to describe something different. Now, for the sake of today's conversation, let's set some boundaries. But unlike usually when we set boundaries, we are actually setting them narrow. We're just going to set them wide so we can actually discuss the many iterations and different metaverses that exist and hopefully add some of our own opinions about this or into this virtual milieu. So for today, from my, my definition, the metaverse is any digital world where individuals have digital identities and some kind of control or access to digital goods. I want to start with Malcolm. Based on that definition, the metaverse is not new. Talk us through your thoughts about what the metaverse is and how it has changed over, frankly, several decades. You know, when we talk about digital world, what do, you, what do we even mean by that? Because it could simply be a game that's online, a community that's online. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to have anything to do with mixed reality, virtual reality, technologies, etc. But I think... A lot of people credit, you know, the science fiction novel Snow Crash in 92 of coining the term metaverse. And within Snow Crash, it basically described this virtual place where characters, you know, go to escape their totalitarian reality. Um, but for me personally, when I think of metaverse, um, I do attribute the 3D aspect of it as a requirement for that definition. And so when you think of it that way, then you can argue that the very one of the very first, if not the first metaverse was Second Life in 2003, right? They basically created a 3D virtual world um, and it's this platform where anyone can come in, you're interacting with live humans through avatars, right? And, and that's why it's called Second Life, right? 
and it created this whole ecosystem, this whole economy, this whole new community. And that, for me, in my perspective, is the definition of what we now call the, 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 the metaverse. You know, you mentioned examples like Ready Player One, sci-fi movie that had the VR kind of like landscape called the, the, the Oasis. And it depicts this, this dystopian future where everyone's just living in the metaverse, you know, and that's it, right? So you're, you're basically sitting in, in your van um, with the, the VR headset. Um, and then, of course, there's a bunch of games that can be described as metaverse here. So um, significance uh, being, you know, the social interaction that you have inside the 3D virtual world. So you have World of Warcraft, you have Fortnite, you have Minecraft, you have Roblox. Um, and then not to mention all the corporate metaverses that are all coming out right now, uh, whether it's Microsoft Teams that, that acquired uh, Altspace VR or uh, Facebook Horizon Worlds. Now, of course, once you layer on this uh, Web3 you know, concept with it, whether it's blockchain-based, NFT-based, et cetera, then you have games and environments like Sandbox, which is effectively a Web3 version of, of Roblox. So this is kind of the range that I see you know, from maybe starting in the, the, the early 90s all the way up to today of like different versions of the metaverse, but they all same, share the same characteristics. In my opinion, 3D environments where you're interacting with live humans, not NPCs, not AIs, not robots, um, live humans, uh, but through avatars, right? So pseudonymous, whatever characters you want via avatars. It doesn't necessarily need to have blockchain involved, doesn't necessarily need to have crypto or NFT involved, but I think that certainly enhances that experience. Uh, but that's how it is sort of depicts then our journey and history of metaverse. All right. I appreciate that, Malcolm. That gives us a good framing for the discussion ahead. I'm going to jump to Suresh now because right now the metaverse, again, it's not conceptual. It's, it's, it's real. It exists. It's, uh, to Malcolm's point, existed in some form or another over the course of the last several decades. And it really exists in our consciousness right now, not only because everyone's talking about it, because many marketers are actually, quote unquote, building in it. Now, a lot of these builds, I would argue, are just for a press release to say I was the first X to do Y. Okay. Now you as a marketer probably have a little bit more tolerance for stuff like that. Um, but uh, I want to, I want to throw it to you to talk about today, the applications of the metaverse for brands and for marketers. What have you seen? What is actually interesting? Is there just a lot of nonsense right now? Gary, I was about to start with saying I was the first one. Then I, I, I stopped myself. I was like, okay, now. <laughs> So I agree with you, right? I, I can't but look at this. I look at all of, a lot of development with a lot of skepticism and cynicism, but I must give it to marketers for trying. And, and quite evidently, uh, CMOs become the target for anything new because uh, not for any other reason, but uh, CMOs have the biggest discretionary budget in an enterprise. Uh, it's not the CTO. It's not the COO. It's not the CFO. Uh, it's not even the CEO. The CMOs are usually sitting on an annual marketing budget. And if you're a new technology or a new product or a new program, um, you know, uh, is, uh, trying to find a way of finding discretionary budgets, uh, a, a, a share of the discretionary budget, you, you will go to the CMO, wouldn't you? So it's easy to see how a lot of these metaverse providers, so, so to speak, uh, have sort of become uh, brand experience providers in some ways. Um, but but what is before I get there, right? What what fascinates me about this entire thing is it's what Malcolm spoke about. He spoke about the Oasis, and I think it is the ability for um, humanity to augment ourselves through with using technology in some way, which is what is super exciting. Um, in in the Oasis, Parzival says people come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, uh, but they stay for all the things they can be. So I think the the ability for um, you know, the metaverse to create um, in a, a sort of a new facet to our identity, uh, to have a digital life, to own things in the digital spaces and, and enjoy, um, you know, a, a, an immersive 3D experience that our, that our brains can process as real. This is where it gets exciting. This is why it is fascinating for marketers, I think. Um, I know that it's a bit flippant to say, um, you know, let's just build something in a metaverse and go and, you know, find some sand to buy some land in the sandbox and do some stuff. But I think the, the big opportunity here is for brands to sort of engage their communities in some way and create that 
you know, extra layer of help create that extra layer of identity for their audiences. I think that is that is where this gets fascinating. Very, very few brands are thinking about it. There is definitely opportunities in uh, doing events. Um, I mean, we have, we do this podcast. We are two dimensional. Wouldn't it be really cool if we are doing a three dimensional? Um, the ability for us to again think about it. Can it can it be little um, less? dull i would imagine i'm not saying that our, our podcast is dull but imagine this right i mean we can we can move our arms and touch and feel and look around and there could, there could be a bit more immersive experience as an event as a as a meeting there's so much going on in that space uh, but i must admit the 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 response to some of these metaverses has been quite underwhelming right i think decentraland I and mean, last week there was an article which said there were uh, 30 active users per day i mean it's quite lonely out there right if you're a decentraland community member you go you walk around there's no one. There are swathes and swathes of brands who have developed stuff, and you're just the only one walking through this huge uh, dystopian metaverse. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, it feels like post-apocalyptic metaverse, right? There is, you know, the, all the metaverse avatars have been destroyed. It's quite sad. Like fact check there, by the way. Just uh, uh, I think Decentraline, you know, basically said that hey, that metric is not even real. So they don't only have 30 DAUs, but uh, but it's not high. I mean, in, I, it's I can, not high. I mean, like we build in the metaverse. But, but why is that, right? But why is that? Why is it underwhelming? Is it because of the expectations of like it's supposed to like completely replace you know our lives, and we're supposed to be fully immersive in like full VR, etc. Like I, I, I think know, that's that's versus... the problem. I think that's the problem. I think that the the um, the, the tech's not there yet. Uh, which is weird to say in 2022, right? Um, but the tech's not there yet. Like Sandbox and Decentraline require a, a significant amount of GPUs to be able to run smoothly. So unless you have a gaming computer or gaming laptop, most of our laptops, were like, it's not a great experience. And I know that they're trying to improve it, both of those two, uh, uh, both of those two metaverse platforms. But uh, right now, the tech's not there. And I think it's because there is this expectation that it has to be fully virtual it has to be 3d which is the point i want to challenge right I, I i think having the compelling immersive experiences that suresh says brands are looking for to have the identities that individuals especially the next generation generation care about in the digital world does not require fully 3d fully virtual environments for instance well first of all we have d-dubs here right d-dubs i would argue is in the metaverse Right. Uh, but he's not in 3D. He's still on this screen and in the YouTube video. So just a 2D image for those people who are listening to our podcast. He's not even an image at all. Uh, but I, I, D-Dub is very much part, in my opinion, of the metaverse. And if we're going to we talked about Yuga Labs earlier and news reactions. Would you say that Bored Apes did not exist in a metaverse until they launched Other Side, which is their sort of virtual 3D immersive world? I would argue that Bored Apes from get go. They existed in a metaverse. It was a 2D metaverse that was literally a clubhouse where you had to go into the bathrooms and figure out what was carved on the bathroom walls to figure out the, you know, uh, all the clues for those initial games that, uh, that Yuga Labs built. But that's a metaverse. That is a bunch of digital identities engaging in community in an extremely compelling way, but not in a 3D immersive hardware required environment. So would you guys say that that's not the metaverse? I disagree. Ah, wow. Well, well, is 3D, is, uh, well, what is a 2D metaverse? I mean, I, I don't know, Gary. I, I don't know. I, I think we have to clarify, though. When What do we mean by 3D? So I don't, when I say 3D, I don't mean VR, right? So I consider, let's right. say, Minecraft or Roblox 3D. Mm -hmm. But yes, I guess technically you're looking at a screen. So technically you're not fully immersed in the, you know, 360 um, but I consider Minecraft, Roblox, 3D. I consider World of Warcraft, you know, et cetera. So, 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 but so what you're so saying, Gary, Ape is that did if, not exist in a metaverse. Right. So, Board Ape, so Board Ape without other side is what? It's just digital. It's just online. Oh, yeah. come on. That is me, an incredibly, incredibly engaged and active community of digital identities, trading digital goods, existing in a fully digital environment. That's what not even by fully metaverse. digital environment. Where are they interacting? Where is this happening? On the on the Yuga Labs and Board Apes platforms, and there's plenty of them. It, it, no, the, that, besides, but that's but before other side. There are plenty of really. Wow, Suresh, go ahead. No, Suresh. Then that's just like any other video game, isn't it? It's just like a regular video game. Then 
Yeah, but not but without yeah. the like the the again the unique verifiable digital identities, the digital asset ownership. Those things I I feel like really matter. But but are you saying that that verifiable digital asset is a requirement to be a metaverse? No, right? Yeah. So exactly. I would argue yes. I would argue yes that if you do not have verifiable uh, unique identities we're talking about for, for this next generation we're talking about a metaverse where you can actually exist um as an individual right not as a character that many 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 people can play the same character so world of warcraft not the same right you're playing the same characters uh counter-strike whatever other video games uh whether whether or not they're multi uh you know mmporgs or otherwise hmm. um it, mmorpgs mmorpgs <laughs> thank you um <laughs> you're still playing characters that 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 a lot of people can play and it's not uniquely yours but i think that the concept of the metaverse is that your individual whatever your your avatar is whatever your digital self is is unique right and i do think that is absolutely a, a, a prerequisite to the metaverses that we're talking about that we feel are truly compelling uh new environments for individuals communities and brands that I agree, right? There is something about, uh, like I said, enhancing your identity or your it's your identity and it's your perhaps, uh, you know, it's a, you use your soul bound token to log in at some point in time and that's what probably will happen, right? So so I, I, I buy that, that, that you should be unique and it's not just another video game. I agree. But the fact that it is, I, I, in my view, the big leap is the next generation of the internet in some ways will be three dimensional or or the it's the, the metaverse is the three dimensional rendering of the internet of some parts of the internet at least is what is exciting for me and i think just board apes as a platform is not the metaverse that is that is that is a web3 platform they were they were doing stuff on web3 because you were buying and selling and trading tokens and all of that stuff and you you utilizing the utility and all of that i mean it it they they went into the metaverse only when they launched other side that was their big leap yeah, I mean, we, we could have a 45 minute conversation just on user experience alone. Um, I feel like it's already been proven that a 3D space is worse for user experience and UI than a 2D space. But OK, we, th there's one of the big on questions what for, right? So here is here's another. I mean, let's 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 take it. Let's take it to uh, let me just move this on. This to just talk reminds about me of the use. This reminds me of the community episode where they're in the metaverse <laughs> and to copy a file, you have to like run across the, like the, the barren lands, do something and then climb up a ladder to put something in a file cabinet. And it takes like freaking an hour and a half to copy a file. Anyway, Suresh, go ahead. I agree. I agree. Right. I think, I think Malcolm asked a question saying, why is this so underwhelming? I think it's underwhelming a because of the hype, but B we are looking at it from a, gaming perspective from a perspective of how can brands engage etc but i think there is a bigger broader opportunity for these three dimensional spaces and the utility of them right i think the two of my favorite examples are example number one is um i think a big elevator company are uh, have just taken on uh, there's this is probably a, there was a news article i don't remember when and where about an elevator company wanting to use um, you know, metaverse st structures and gaming engines to train their people because it's high risk to put put apart a pull apart an elevator and put it back together. You can't do it every day, so they are using it. The, the, there was a very controversial news article about, um, or there was some controversy at least about Microsoft's a big deal with the U.S. Army to use Hololens. It was a multi-million dollar deal. Uh, I don't even know if it's a multi-billion dollar deal uh, to use Hololens and simulations for. Um, you know, frontline uh, soldiers for them to simulate using something, right? So they were they were, they were going to be sort of trained uh, without loss of life or without real bullets and without use of real ammo uh, before they get onto the get onto real simulation. So there are there are probably multiple uses that we don't see yet, right? But the metaverse stuff that's being shilled right now is for people to go and play some stuff and it's sort of play to earn. Uh, I don't think that's sustainable at all. But but I think that the key differentiator there is maybe what Gary said is the identity piece. So you can go into these virtual worlds and train, but if your identity, your physical real world identity is not part of that metaverse, then is it a metaverse or is it just a virtual 
you okay, know, space. so so that that brings us to actually the <laughs> the big topic that we've left to the last few minutes of the podcast, which is if we're going to talk about individual identity, then how important is the blockchain for a metaverse that can actually scale? And that is actually interesting for the next generations. Yeah, I think that's the key question. How do you make identity work in a virtual environment, a digital environment? It has to be something where it's tied to you <clears throat> and one that you cannot necessarily change. So in this case, like the blockchain definitely provides that. You know, we talked about decentralized identities, et cetera. Um, the ability to effectively have a digital representation of you. I think blockchain creates this technology that allows you to do things like that, especially not even identity, by the way, any item within the metaverse, right? So any item that can be verified as quote unquote authentic or verified as, you know, this is the one item and the many, many copies that maybe you can create are not the one items. Um, I think that's uh, interesting. Now, we also haven't talked about how this extends metaverses in general, right? So there probably isn't going to be just one metaverse. So how can you take that same identity and use it in multiple metaverses? So the interoperability of this as well. I think well, that... Yeah, w without the blockchain, the interoperability is effectively impossible, right? Um, and then without exactly. the blockchain, in my mind, um, those individual identities will not be worth anything. I mean, we have spent our entire lives uh, existing... I mean, not our entire lives, really the last 20 years, existing on the servers of very, very large companies. And just D-Dubs, just D-Dubs his entire life. Yeah, just D-Dubs entire life. He's existed in, in, in that world. But the rest of us, the last 20 years, existing on the servers of very, very big companies, generating data, creating our identities in those specific closed environments uh, for the benefit of these publicly traded companies. I, I know I'm getting into philosophy, the Web3 philosophy, blah, blah, blah. We all know that. I think that the only reason why the metaverse is now suddenly compelling is the idea that we can put all of that time and energy, all of our creativity into virtual versions of ourselves that we actually control and own. That is not the property of somebody else, but the property of us, ours, our, it's, it's, it's ours. Um, and that's what makes the metaverse compelling. And that's why blockchain, I think, is absolutely necessary for a metaverse that has any impact and for a metaverse that we should care about in the future. So I am talking about the open metaverse, right? That is powered by blockchain. Not a closed metaverse, not what Facebook and Meta are building. But I actually, I do not believe in that future at all. I mean, like, yes, there's a lot of bad press around it. Um, avatars not having legs until very, very recently. Um, them looking super, super janky until a recent update. And the fact that even, you know, Facebook and Meta employees don't use it. And I know it's, it's all focused on work and meetings and who wants to be in a meeting, even if it's in a 3D world, right? Um, so I think that they've gotten the entire concept wrong. But the, but the thing I think that they've gotten completely wrong is that they are absolutely trying to keep it only on their servers so that they can monetize it, they can control of it. And they've completely missed the point of why the metaverse is going to matter to the next generation and why we as leaders and builders and marketers and storytellers actually think that there is going to be some value and worth in an open metaverse. And so I just, I frankly don't believe in Meta's vision for all of this stuff. I'll try and disagree here, right? Uh, I think, I know Meta gets a lot of rap for everything and Zuckerberg's probably the most hated technology CEO. Uh, I think there was some study that said that, right? So, uh, I mean- Elon's been tweeting about Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, uh, which is, but but I think, I mean, you, you look at Meta and you go, well, Meta as a company has three and a half billion users on their platform. Um, we are talking about at this point in time, uh, for us to create mass adoption, we need big organizations to come on board and do something big. That's the, that's the first point, right? I think for us to get scale in this space for multiple applications to come on board, we need more and more communities. And, and, and in, in some ways, Facebook was the first place for digital communities to form at scale. Yes, of course, there were Yahoo groups and MySpaces and whatever else, but Facebook became the sort of super frictionless, uh, easy place for uh, groups to be created. And, and that created really ardent communities. And in some ways, you can say that that is what kind of backfired because then those communities became uh, polarized communities and they lived in their own echo chambers and et cetera. And there was, there was sort of big issues. But you need someone to look over this. And, and human beings, uh, in some ways, I mean, we 
there are bad actors permeate everywhere. There are bad actors in Web 1, bad actors in Web 2. There are bad actors in Web 3. There's lots of issues about, uh, you know, harassment and all sorts of stuff coming through. And you need somebody to be able to check this. And someone recently said, you know, or was it recently? Uh, quite a while ago, perhaps. Maybe this was Machiavellian, um, who, um, quote, which was, democracy is the, is the best form of, uh, in, uh, of government in the hands of the virtuous. Um, I think, I think, Web3 and decentralization will probably be the best technology in the hands of the virtuous, right? If you give it to bad actors, they will make it really, really bad. And all the things that we hate about the internet, uh, we will we will have to go through all of that again. So what I really don't mind is someone uh, who tries to, maybe they monetize it, which is fine with me, but at least creates a safe path for the next generations to come on board rather than a massively decentralized clusterfuck. We need to have this conversation again. D-dubs, I want to suggest that uh, we actually have a what if scenario where the what if scenario is what if meta and their version of the metaverse becomes our reality. Okay. Um, so let's, let, let, let's take it from that, that, that perspective. What if, what if meta's right and, uh, and they win? Uh, what does that mean for the future? So I definitely want to have that conversation with Suresh and Malcolm. Uh, unfortunately, we've got to wrap up now. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we raised more questions than we answered. Um, and I, I guess that this little conversation is a perfect example of how confusing the metaverse is. I don't think we answer the question, WTF is the metaverse. We have no idea. I mean, it's not that we have no idea. It's that we don't fully agree, right? Now, what we can agree on is that it is a new type of potential future reality, which presents great opportunities for individuals, great opportunities for storytelling, great opportunities for community and interaction, and therefore great opportunities for brands to participate. Uh, we're not sure whether or not it has to be 3D. I think it's two versus one. I think I'm on the losing end of that. Uh, we're not sure if it has to have blockchain. I think that is also two versus one. I think Gary, uh, Malcolm and I are on the same side and, and, and Suresh is on another. And we're not sure whether or not um, a walled garden version of it uh, is actually good or bad. The tech really isn't there yet. The bottlenecks to mass adoption are everywhere. Um, and I think that you know what we do agree on is that it is not only worth paying attention to, it's worth experimenting in uh, and over time, uh, I think hopefully uh, the scale problems are going to be removed and we're going to see a consolidated, not centralized, but consolidated definition of the virtual digital world that we're going to exist in uh, with digital identities and digital assets come to fruit. So with that, we're going to wrap up for today. This has been Web3 and Whiskey. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite audio channel. And if you don't mind our mugs, go smash that like and subscribe button on YouTube. Also, please subscribe to the weekly Departures newsletter that further explores Web3 innovations and provides explainers for the enterprise world. Join us next week for more Web3 debates and more whiskey. I'm Gary Lee. Thank you for listening. See you next time.